So the topic is INT APIs is the new black, or the hottest thing in the integration space. Okay. Let's see how it works, whether I'm uh, lying or what I'm trying to say here. Right? So before jumping into the present time, where are the integration rules, let's take a quick look at how IAM evolved over the recent decades. Right? So you must be pretty familiar with this setup. Right? There are different applications. They all um, managing the identity by themselves. Right? So we call them siloed IAM. They are independent. They do everything independently. There's uh, no integration at all between the two uh, or different applications. So this John Lee is an employee of Kermit Corporation. Now, all these applications are apps of Kermit, but still, this employee needs to go and uh, create a user profile in each of the apps and provide uh, credentials when uh, he wants to authenticate. So he might have to maintain different sets of credentials because each of these applications maintain the users in different user stores. So that's how it used to be. Is it the case still at your place? I hope not. Right. So it's not only always a one app and one user store. There can be uh, multiple applications in single silo. But the thing is, they are independent, and there is no interaction between those two. OK, so Kermit organization identified the problem. And they uh, brought in a centralized IND provide into the picture. Now, all the apps have offloaded the INT and access management work to this centralized IAM. But still, there's a problem. These apps uh, talk with INT provider in a proprietary protocol. It's a Kermit proprietary. Right. And uh, so still, uh, now the user store is governed by the INT provider. The developers of these applications or any newer applications don't have to worry about uh, securing the identity. Right. But the problem is not solved yet. Right. So these are proprietary APIs. Now, let's say there are partners of this organization. Let's say this organization acquires another business, or a merge happens. Now, there are different external applications that wants to provide the services to the users of Kermit. Now, they want to integrate together. But can they do that? No, right? Because they don't know how to talk with the Kermit IND provider, because that protocol is proprietary. Now, there's a blocker for this integration and blocker for the progress of the business, right? So these are the key problems in a siloed IAM setup. One is. Uh, same physical user is digitally represented across different silos. They need to use different credentials each time they want to log in. There's no single sign-on. Even within the workspace itself, that user needs to log in again, again, and again. Right? And there's a higher probability of identity mismanagement. So developers are trying to secure. Developers are maintaining the identity. They have the responsibility of securing that. That's a huge responsibility. Rather than concentrating on the business logic, developing the business logic, now they need to concentrate on maintaining the identity as well. So it can cause a lot of identity mismanagement problems. And most importantly, it is difficult or sometimes quite impossible to make integrations across borders, across department borders, or across enterprise borders. Right? So those are the key problems of silo diet. Kermit understood the problem, introduces standard APIs. So this is something called like an uh, open identity platform. So this identity provider can now talk in standard protocols. For example, uh, HR application will uh, authenticate using SAML SSO. I'm not going to dig into details of the protocols right now. And it can provision users using Scheme and authorize using SACML, all are standard APIs. Similarly, payroll, license, all the applications now communicate in standard APIs. Now what if Finnog CRM app wants to communicate with any provider? If it can talk in standard APIs, it can talk with Kermit IND provider. So the problem is solved for Kermit. 
or is it? Did Kermit live happily ever after with the IM solution? Not quite so. Remember Shara's talk? Customer IEM came into the picture with a whole lot of new demands on the IEM solution. It demanded the customer should be able to log in using their social accounts or any other identity they own, they trust. Not what the corporate wants that person to use. Right? And they wanted a seamless experience across devices we call omnichannel. So they start, uh, let's say, Google Doc work in their laptop, and then they move to the mobile, and they still want to do that. Right. So they're associating not with a company or organization, they're associating with a brand. If the brand is not capable to provide a seamless experience, they move to the competition. Simple as that. Then they have a lot of privacy concerns, consent management. So Ishara talked a lot about that, so I'm not going to go into that area. So they want to remove consent or modify consent whenever they want. And they want to have the ownership of the user information. And additionally, uh, a novel idea is the party to party delegation. For example, I am a, a patient and I have my medical records in a hospital. Now I want to share these records with the doctor, all the records, but I want to share some of them with my insurer, not everything. And another with my spouse, not everything. Maybe. Right. So that is party to party delegation. Me as the patient, I am delegating to another person the authorization to access a subset of my data. So that is again a part of um, custom IEM. So at a glance, there are multiple devices the customer will use to communicate with the organization. And they want to authenticate with their trusted identity providers or cloud services, Facebook, Google, you name it. Right. And uh, so they want to, uh, when they onboard, they, after onboarding, they want to have, uh, uh, like onboarding should be uh, seamless with maybe social sign up. And then they want to manage their accounts as Ishara explained. And at the same time, from the uh, company's point of view, they need to track this customer and continuously build the profile of the customer, build the identity of the customer, right? taking his interactions with the uh, uh, company, so the company can provide a better, uh, better experience to the customer, and they will stick with the company for a long time. Right? So that's why when that customer comes to self-care portal, ID provider will provision that customer to their CRM custom relationship management. Now, CRM will get a lot of other inputs from a lot of other departments and areas about customer behaviors and et cetera. So this is uh, why IT APIs is the hottest thing. So at the top, we all are concerned about business success. That's what we want at the end. Right. It depends on the custom satisfaction. Now, custom satisfaction depends on the seamless experience. Seamless experience depends on identity integrations. For example, all of these are integrations. Provisioning using scheme, authenticating uh, single sign-on using OpenID Connect, all are identity integrations. And they go across the borders as well, not only within the company. So these are complex integrations, identity integrations happening right now. And the base, the backbone of everything is are the identity APIs. So that's a good reason why I called it the hottest thing in the integration. Right. So there's a bigger challenge, identity of things. Right. There's a hell lot of devices getting connected to the internet every day, every minute, and each of them have their own identity. They need a way to dynamically register. We can't go and register each and everything. They want to authenticate. Uh, within devices, uh, let's say a sensor needs to authenticate so an actuator knows this is the actual sensor that's send, sending me the sensor, otherwise it will do uh, something that's not intended. Right. And then delegation of device access. For example, uh, in my house, if I have a CCTV camera, right, I don't want to give the permission to rotate that camera to my housemate. But it, 
due to some circumstance, housemaid request access. Now I want to give, because maybe uh, she saw some thief or someone outside the building, and now she wants to rotate the camera. Now I want to delegate the device access to a different person. So all of these are challenges, and a lot of research are happening on this area. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so we talk about the evolution, and uh, then why this, is, this has become the hottest thing because of custom IAM and uh, INT of uh, things. Now we look into some of the modern INT APIs that you can use for INT integration. So we talked about Scheme, that is system for cross-domain INT management. So the name itself tells it goes cross-domain. It's all about integration, nothing else. So there are three domains. Uh, and there are three INT providers governing maybe different uh, sets of uh, user stores. Like there can be Active Directories, there can be LTAPs, there can be MySQL databases. Right. Now, a user in bar organization now might want to access uh, things on the foo, and that user needs to be provisioned. And at the same time, that user needs to provision to some external API, some external INT provider. So all of these are possible through Scheme. That is the sort of a de facto REST standard for user provisioning. So it has both inbound and outbound. So when the customer first self-register, it's an inbound call that happens to the INT provider. And at the same time, simultaneously, that INT can be provisioned to somewhere else. So these are some sample uh, payloads. Uh, it's straightforward, it's JSON, and you send the user details, and you send the group uh, details, and you can associate them together, and do all the CRUD operations related to Scheme. Now I'm coming to delegated authorization, uh, partic uh, especially O2. I guess all of you know O2, right? So that's sort of the uh, standard everyone follows nowadays. So. Basically, the, the story is when you um, go to YouTube and you want to share some video on Facebook, you click share, and Facebook pop-ups ask you to log in, give consent, and the video gets shared. So you wanted to share the video, but you asked YouTube to do that. You delegated that job. Now, YouTube can't do that because YouTube doesn't have your credentials. right? So that's why Facebook came in the middle, got your credentials, and issued an access token to YouTube, so it can post the video on behalf of you. That's the simple story. Right. And there are multiple grants, we call them as. Basically, in simple terms, those are use cases. So how to get some use case done using OAuth? There are multiple grants. Uh, so these are the most uh, widely used grants right now. Uh, one is the authorization code grant. Then SAML bearer grant, that means if your app is already doing SAML SSO, single sign-on, you can exchange your SAML token to an OAuth access token. Similarly, if you have a JWT-based authentication, you can exchange that to an OAuth access token. So these are authentication protocols, SAML, JW, uh, JWT, and et cetera. Now, OAuth is about authorization. So you want to exchange your authentication token to an authorization token. So this is the uh, authorization code grant flow. So I'm not uh, going into details of that. But I would like to point to some interesting APIs in this. Uh, so basically, uh, the concept is there's an authorization server, then there's a resource server, and then there's an application who wants to access the resource server on behalf of the user. So the user grants consent, give permission, uh, so the authorization, authorization server can issue a token so the client can use that token and access the resource. Now, one prerequisite is this client application needs to be registered in the OAuth authorization server. You can either manually do that, or the client app can do that dynamically. Remember the scenario of INT of things, IoT? intent of this. So it's a requirement that they have to dynamically register with an OSINT server. You can't always go and do that. Right. So there's a profile called dynamic client registration. There's an API that can do this call and register. 
And also another interesting API is the introspect API, where the resource server can give the token to the other server and ask whether this token is valid. Okay. Right. So OAuth 2 is about authorization. It doesn't deal with authentication. So from an OAuth access token, you can't figure out who the user is. It's mostly OPEC, right? But uh, so there's a gap. So OIDC came into the picture to provide authentication layer on top of OAuth. So in addition, additionally, it introduces a, introduced a new token named ID token, a JWT, containing all the user claims. So the client application is now aware of who the user is and what are the claims. Right? And also it introduced a new endpoint named user info. So this uh, token can be given to the user info and get additional uh, information from uh, the authorization server. Right. So from the OAuth flow, there are only a few changes. Um, you get an ID token with an access token. Right? ID token is for authentication. Access token is for authorization. And you can pass that access token to user info, and you can get additional information. Right. So let's quickly jump to party-to-party -party delegation with UMA. Who has heard of UMA? Maybe Prabhat has mentioned that. So that's sort of the big thing happening, uh, user-managed access. This is where I mentioned me as the patient. I want to share my details with the doctor and the insurer, subset of information. Right. So UMA is developed on top of O2O, and it tries to uh, solve this problem. OAuth is about giving, uh, delegating the authorization to a client application. UMA is about delegating that authorization to an actual person, a human. Right? So uh, in UMA, uh, there's an additional party called requesting party. And uh, this is the flow. So uh, let me check whether I have enough time. <laughs> OK. So uh, yeah, so there are two tokens that is called a PAT and an RPT. So basically, the resource server will first go and register its resources on the authorization server. Then the resource owner will go and define policies on the authorization server on those resources. Who can do what on my resources? And now when a client application, a requesting party wants to access one of resource owner's resources, then the client uh, the other server will evaluate those policies and check whether the required claims are there and grant taxes. So that's the high-level overview. Um, so I'm not going to go into details. Right. Then coming to authorization, a fine-grained authorization, the de facto standard is SACML. Uh, so basically, you can authorize uh, using attributes of a user. For example, if it is a web app selling alcohol and you can't, you shouldn't uh, uh, sell those to people below 21 years old. That's an attribute, the age of the user. Now, SACML can, SACML can be used to authorize to that level, to a finer grain level. And you can't sell it to someone from Asia or someone from uh, US or whatever. Geographical location and time-based authorization. Everything can be done using SACML. So there are four key components. One is the policy administration point, policy decision point, policy information point and the policy enforcement point. So basically, there's an administrator who defines the policies and add them to the policy through the policy administration point. And the application has what you call the policy enforcement point. That's where the actual authorization request is going from to the INT provider. And INT provider, in the INT provider, there's policy decision point, which will go through all the defined policies and check whether this request can be authorized or not. So these policies are based on XML format. So those are not coupled to the code. So you can change your policies at will. Your code will not get impacted. Right. So we talked about user consent management. Then there are APIs uh, that should provide end user the access uh, to the consent they have given. Right. And also there are APIs that should give access to the PII data of that user, right? So user should be able to download those data at any time and even ask the IND provider to delete those data. Um, that's uh, especially according to GDPR and other recent developments. 
Okay, so that's a quick walkthrough. Of, there are a lot of other APIs. So these are some of the key APIs that are relevant for today's uh, problems uh, and standards like GDPR and other uh, uh, cases. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? All right, so we'll be here. Uh, if there's any question, please uh, let us know. Thank you.